Lord God, what a sweet truth that is. You went to the cross to save us, and we'll be able to see you in glory, Lord. Thank you for that. Lord, give us a desire, strengthen our love for you. Um, Use this morning as an opportunity for us to grow in our love for you, Lord, in your name. Amen. There are men in the front here with Bibles. If you don't have one, just raise your hand. They'd love to put one in your hands. Um, We'll be opening up God's word this morning. Um, This is the time in our service where we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. And as we do that this morning, I want to talk about what a Christian's love for God looks like. Scripture is riddled with verses about our love for God. And in many of them, it's a command. And so I want to start this time by reading through several of them briefly. I'm going to go too quick for you to keep up. Um, So just listen while I read these verses. Deuteronomy 6.5 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Deuteronomy 10.12 says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Joshua 23.11 says, So take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. And Psalm 31.23 says, Oh, love the Lord, all you, his godly ones. And then this command is carried into the New Testament. Matthew 22.37 says, And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. 1 Corinthians 8.3 says, But if anyone loves God, he is known by him. And finally, the verse that got me started on this lesson, Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. We probably all have that verse memorized. We've taken comfort in that truth. However, I think the two words that seem to get glossed over in this verse are the two in the middle. Love God. This isn't a command in this verse, but it's a title. Those who love God. What does it mean to love God? I've listed out five tenets concerning our love for God. I want to go over them right now. The first one is the nature of our love for God. Thomas Watson says this so well. Love is an expansion of soul or an inflaming of the infections by which a Christian breathes after God as the supreme and sovereign good. 1 John 4.19 tells us that we love because he first loved us. Love is not something we can conjure up because we want to reap the benefits of a love for God. Love is something that God gives you. Look back at Romans 8.28. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This isn't referring to multiple sets of people. Those who love God are those who are called according to his purpose. The nature of love is an inflaming of affections for God that is given to us by God. The next tenet is the foundation of our love for God. And this foundation is a knowledge of him. If you want to strengthen a love for God, you must study him. We study our spouses, right? We ask them what their desires are, what troubles them, what excites them. We know their strengths. And all of these things help us love our spouses better. We can learn the same things about God in his word. We need to build a foundation of love for God on a right understanding of who God is. The third tenet is that a love for God outshines everything else. My parents have a ranch in Skull Valley, which is basically in the middle of nowhere. And there have been many nights where we've gone out on the back porch, turned all the lights off, and stared up at the sky and seen the stars. And they're like nothing you see down here. You can actually see the Milky Way looking like a wave of stars. It's amazing. And then morning comes, and the stars disappear. Because the light of the sun is so bright that it drowns them out. When we set a high value on God at being the most sublime and infinite good, We so esteem him that we don't want anything else. 
God outshines the stars. All things vanish in our thoughts when the sun of righteousness shines in his full splendor. A love for God outshines everything. The fourth tenet is the love of God is sincere and complete. A love of God must be a sincere love. Ephesians 6, 24 says, Grace be with all of you who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an incorruptible love. Incorruptible or sincere here alludes to honey that is quite pure. Our love to God is sincere when it's pure and without self-interest. Many people say they love God because he gives them something, but not for his intrinsic excellencies. We must love God more for what he is than what he gives. Paired with this sincerity, our love must be entire, meaning it must be complete. Going back to the command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. God doesn't want to be an inmate in your heart with other rooms where sin gets to reside. God wants to be all of your heart. The last tenet I want to talk about is the degree of love. We must love God above all other objects. Psalm 73, 25 says, There is nothing on earth that I desire besides thee. Thomas Watson, in his book on this verse, says this, God is the quintessence of all good things. He is superlatively good. God, who is the chief of our happiness, must have the chief of our affections. Love to God must be above all other things, as oil swims above water. We must love God more than relations. Our blessed Savior speaks of hating father and mother. Christ would not have us be unnatural. But if our dearest relationships stand in our way and would keep us from Christ, either we must step over them or not know them. We must love God more than our estate. If the world laid in one scale and Christ in the other, he must weigh heaviest. When the love of God bears sway in the heart, all other love is suspended and is as nothing in comparison to this love. So as we prepare our hearts for the Lord's suppers, what can we do, what can we learn from this today? Christian, I wanna to speak to you first. We love God because he first loved us. We know the primary way he showed his love for us was sending his son to the cross. This is the model of love he has given us. We must meditate on the fullness of who God is and what he's done, and then this morning, make an intentional commitment to love God the way we've described today. Let him outshine everything in our hearts. But there's another group here. There are some who don't love God. I want to talk to you for a minute. There are many reasons that you could be here today, but I hope that you're here to listen to this next point. Christ went to the cross to show his love for you. There is nothing you can do in and of yourself to cultivate an understanding of that truth, that truth that will drive you to a love for God. But if anything I'm saying resonates with you, if you're listening and you're thinking that there's a room full of people that love their God this way, and I want to know something of that, please see me or one of the elders after the service. We'd love to talk to you about our Savior and how much we love our Savior. However, during this communion time, this is a time for those that do love God, so please let the elements pass you by. We're going to take communion on your, our own today, and then I'm going to come back and pray through Psalm 31. Men, come forward. <clears throat>